My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, it was the 13th year after Nubuwa, the 13th year after prophethood. And it was after 13 years of hardship at the hands of the Quraysh. And it was after two hijras to Habasha, and after three years of sanctions. And it was after the death of Abu Talib and Khadija radiallahu anha. And it was after da'wah in Ta'if and being stoned in Ta'if. It was after all this that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knocked the door of Abu Bakr radiallahu an at around midday. A time which was not common or a time in which it was not common for people to visit one another. They wouldn't visit one another around midday. It was at this time that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knocks his door. And when Abu Bakr radiallahu an understood that at the door was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that he was there at this time, he understood that the moment of hijrah to Medina had arrived. The hijrah to Medina, a blast from the past moment that would be a great means of Islam flourishing up till today and up till the day of Qiyam. A moment that would be used as the foundation of, his, of the Islamic calendar. And Abu Bakr knew as well that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him to be the companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during this historical event. Immediately, a great means and strategy was put into effect. They planned their route to Medina via the direction towards Yemen. Why? Because this wouldn't be the first place that the Quraysh would look for them after they realized that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr had departed. So they strategized. They took a different route. They planned their point of stay till the search parties that were searching for them would die down. They planned a way to receive provisions during their stay in the famous cave of Thawr. They planned a way also to receive intel regarding the intensity of the search parties that the Quraysh had sent out. They wanted to know exactly what is happening with the search parties. How intense is the search? And they wanted to know when the intensity had died down or moved to another place. All this was planned. All these strategies came into effect. They wanted to make an informed decision with regards to when they could continue their journey to Medina. They also had in mind the guide that would be hired to successfully assist their journey to Medina. Indeed, they took the means and they planned meticulously. And as they planned meticulously, the Quraysh plotted as well. For the Quraysh, my dear brothers and sisters, they were angered by the fact that they missed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr. And for those who know the seerah, you would know that they were plotting to kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they also had an effective plot in place or what they thought was effective. They had the alleyways covered. Surveillance was in place. They could not understand how he slipped through their surveillance. They were very angry. So now they placed a mighty ransom in place, a ransom of 100 camels, the best camels. Perhaps today, in our time, we would equate it to perhaps 100 red Ferraris, right? This was the ransom that was put in place for the person who caught Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they began to search every route, every gully, every alleyway. This is what they did. And the plot was so effective that they even reached the foot of the cave that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr were hiding in. This is how effective their plan was. But there was a mighty difference, my dear brothers and sisters. There was a difference between the planning of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the plot of the Quraysh. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, the Quraysh, they plotted 
and place their trust in their people's ability. They place their trust in the plot itself. Their hope for success was created by placing their confidence in their plan, in their abilities, in their personnel, in their search parties. This is where they place their trust. But with regards to the plan of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then this plan was built upon the placement of one's trust, not in the creation, but in the one who is in control of everything. In the one who is the creator of everything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal, Al Wahid al Qahar, Al Ahad, Al Samad, Al Ladi lam yalid wa lam yulad, wa lam yakullahu kufu wa ahad, subhanahu wa ta'ala. They trust was in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quraysh got really close to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were at the foot of the cave. Abu Bakr cries out and says, O oh, Prophet of Allah, O oh, Messenger of Allah, if these people had to look at their feet, they will expose us. Why did he say this? Because they were in Agar. And Agar is different to a kahf. Agar refers to a cave that when you enter, you have to go into the cave downwards. So when you get into the cave, you're actually at a lower position to the actual mouth of the cave. This is different to the cave in Surah Al-Kahf. The cave of the people of the story of the cave. They were in a kahf. A kahf refers to a flat cave. When you enter the cave and the inside of the cave is at the same surface level as the mouth of the cave. Like when we enter a bedroom of ours or any room in our home. We don't go downwards, right? The, 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 uh, the surface area of the room is at the same level as the entrance. This is a kahf. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in the cave of Thawr and this cave was a ghar. So they were actually downwards. For them to be spotted, these search parties would have to bend down and look inside the cave. So Abu Bakr, he tells Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if they look at the position of their feet, we will be exposed. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says back to Abu Bakr, that oh Abu Bakr, what is your view of two people? that has Allah as the third. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to Abu Bakr, as Allah tells us in the Quran, do not be afraid, indeed Allah is with us. This is what happened. This my dear brothers and sisters is tawakkul. This is tawakkul. And this my dear brothers and sisters is a picturesque, a story style definition of tawakkul, which is the theme of today's lecture, Alhamdulillah. Tawakkul, my dear brothers and sisters, is an Arabic term. And it is a term found in both the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in the English language, we translate tawakkul as placing one's trust in Allah or focusing one's reliance only on Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Now what does this mean? It basically means, my dear brothers and sisters, that tawakkul is the understanding that we do not put food on our tables, but rather it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sustains us. It teaches us, my dear brothers and sisters, that it is not our degrees or our skill sets or our abilities or our intelligence that causes outcomes to be, but rather that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who showers upon our matters acceptance and mercy and as a result, they come to be. And those outcomes are deemed successful. It is with the will and permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not based on any endeavor from ourselves. What we do is a means, but success and all of success is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is tawakkul, my dear brothers and sisters. How many a time today do we hear people say, it is I who puts food on my table. How many a time do we hear people today say, it was my idea, it was my intelligence, it was, it was, it, it was my intelligence and, and quickness that I picked up on a certain thing that the deal went through. How many times do we hear this today? It is I who puts food on the table. This is very common, my dear brothers and sisters. This is not the statement of a believer and it should not be the statement of a believer. A believer is one that takes the means but understands 
that all success is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a believer is the one who says, Alhamdulillah, all praises belongs to Allah, the one who blessed us with sustenance. All praises belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who inspired me to be diligent so I could study well and I could perform well in my exams. All praises belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who blessed me with these results. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There's no power nor might except from Allah. All praises belongs to Allah for the, vehicle, for the vehicle that I drive. Indeed, if Allah didn't bless me with this gift, I would not have a vehicle. And if Allah didn't bless me with the ability to drive, I wouldn't have driven. I'm trying to just mention to you mundane activities, brothers and sisters, that today we turned a blind eye to. And we attribute success in them to us when the success should be attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawakkul, my dear brothers and sisters, teaches us to be far away from those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never praised. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Zumar, in ayah number 49, describes a people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not praise. Allah says, فَإِذَا مَسَّ الْإِنسَانَ ضُرٌ دَعَانَا ثُمَّ إِذَا خَوَّلْنَاهُ نِعْمَةً ثُمَّ إِذَا خَوَّلْنَاهُ نِعْمَةً مِنَّا قَالَ إِنَّمَا أُوْتِيتُهُ عَلَى عِلْمٍ بَلْ هِيَ فِتْنَةٌ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Allah says, and when adversity touches man, he calls upon us, he calls to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, when we bestow him with a favor, when Allah lifts his difficulty, when Allah causes favors to fall upon him and reach him, what does he say? He says, I have only been given it because of my knowledge. It's because of me. It's because of my doing, my degree, my ability, my intelligence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, rather this is a trial. It's a test. It's a trial. But most of them do not know. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Ameen. And may Allah make us from the mutawakkilun. Ameen. Tawakkul, my dear brothers and sisters, is from the noblest acts of worship. And there are many evidences that make this clear for us and make this manifest for us. Let's take a few, inshallah, in the time that we have together. The first evidence that teaches us how noble tawakkul is and teaches us why we should be from the family of the people of tawakkul is that firstly, from the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-wakil. From the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-wakil. And I think if we only mention this point, it is enough for us to understand how important it is for us to have tawakkul. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose as a name and attribute from his names and attributes, this name al-wakil. What does it mean? We can only loosely translate it brothers and sisters because Allah is so perfect. But we can loosely translate it by saying that al-wakil refers to the one who is perpetually the best guardian and protector of our affairs in the most absolute and complete way. This is who al-wakil is. Let me repeat it. The one who is perpetually the best guardian and protector of our affairs in the most absolute and complete way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلًا Allah says that Allah is enough for us as a wakil. Allah is the best disposer of our affairs. The best place to, 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 to place your trust in is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we recite, وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلًا It actually teaches us another evidence. Or, or, or gives us another reason that teaches us why tawakkul is important. And that is for the simple fact, my dear brothers and sisters, that yes, indeed Allah is enough for us. Allah is enough for us. He is a samad the one upon who everything in creation is dependent upon. Every tree and every leaf on every tree that shivers because of the wind that reaches it, you must understand that that leaf does not shiver except because of the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah decreed that it shivers. Every heartbeat that beats in every human being that exists and every other creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that exists 
it beats because of As-Samad, because of the one upon who everything in creation is dependent upon. Indeed, Allah is enough for us. وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلَ Understand this. Imagine, imagine if we were in charge of our heart beating. What would happen? We'd forget, <laughs> right? You'd forget. Then what happens? You end up dying. Then you say, subhanallah, I forgot. No, no, you can't even say that. It's too late. It's too late, right? So our hearts beat whether we remember, whether we don't remember, whether we awake, whether we asleep. Why? Because everything in creation is dependent upon as samad Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, Allah is enough for us. And this is a reason why we should, or this is an evidence that we should deduce this understanding regarding the nobility of tawakkul from that indeed Allah is al-wakil and indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enough for us. The third reason, my dear brothers and sisters, that teaches us why tawakkul is noble and why we should be from the people of tawakkul is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cited the messengers and cited all those people that Allah praised to be people of tawakkul. Look at Ibrahim alayhi salam when they prepared the fire for him and they threw him into the fire. What did he say? He said, as we find in the hadith of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma in Sahih al-Bukhari, he said, Allah." This is what he said. He said, indeed Allah is enough for me. And indeed Allah is the best place to put my trust in. He is the best disposer of all affairs. Allah praises Ibrahim alayhi salam for this. And as Ibrahim places his trust in Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands this very hot fire that was created to burn him to be cool and safe for Ibrahim alayhi salam. This is the reality, brothers and sisters. And Allah praises Ibrahim alayhi salam for this. If we look further, my dear brothers and sisters, in terms of those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praise, praises, Allah tells us in his book about a group from the hypocrites that went to the Muslims to, to create fear, to fear monger. They went to the Muslims and said, you know what? The Quraysh have gathered against you. So be scared of them. This is what they did. This is what they said to the Muslims. Allah tells us in his book. فَانْقَلَبُوا بِنِعْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَفَضْلٍ لَمْ يَمْسَسْهُمْ سُوءٍ وَاتَّبَعُوا رِضْوَانَ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ ذُو الْفَضْلِ الْعَظِيمِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those to whom the hypocrites said, indeed the people have gathered against you, so fear them. But all that did was increase the belief of the believers. And they said, Hasbun Allah, sufficient for us is Allah, wa ni'mal wakil, and He is the best disposer of our affairs. So Allah says, So they returned with a favor from Allah and a bounty from Allah, and no harm touched them. And they pursued the pleasure of Allah. And indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the possessor of great bounty. Right? So this is another. Uh, we see a group of people being praised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are being praised for what? For the fact that they were from the mutawakkilun, those who practiced tawakkul, those who worshipped Allah with tawakkul. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in his book, he praises the messengers, right? He praises his messengers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ibrahim, in ayah number 12, he says that the messengers say, وَمَا لَنَا أَلَّا نَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَقَدْ هَدَانَا سُبُلَنَا وَلَنَصْبِرَنَّ عَلَى مَا آذَيْتُمُونَا وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُتَوَكِّلُونَ Allah says that the messenger said, And why should we not rely upon Allah whilst He has guided us to our good ways? And we will surely be patient against whatever harm you should cause us. And upon Allah, let those who would rely, rely. Right? Because we know the messengers, they face difficulties from the people that they went to. But they said, whatever you do to us, we will only rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will be people of tawakkul. You can do what you please, but our reliance is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises them. 
Also from the reasons why tawakkul is noble and important is because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us about tawakkul in many a narration. For he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَوْ تَوَكَّلْتُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ حَقَّ تَوَكُّلِهِ لَرَزَاكَكُمْ كَمَا يَرْزُقُ الطَّيْرِ تَغْدُ خِمَاصًا وَتَعُودُ بِطَانًا He said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you relied on Allah with a true reliance, He would provide for you the same as He provides for the birds. They set off in the early morning with empty stomachs and they return back at the end of the day with full stomachs. La ilaha illallah. This hadith is in Sunan At-Tirmidhi and also narrated by Imam Ahmed and others. Rahmatullahi alayhim ajma'een. Also in another teaching of my dear brothers and sisters, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he teaches Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhumah and he says to him oh young man I shall teach you some words and give you some advice be mindful of Allah and Allah will protect you be mindful of Allah and you will find him in front of you if you have a need to ask ask Allah and if you seek help seek help from Allah and know that even if the entire people and community were to gather together to benefit you with something, they would not benefit you with anything except that which Allah has already recorded for you. Subhanallah. And if they were to gather together to harm you with something, they will not be able to harm you except with that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already recorded against you. Subhanallah. No one can fight the decree of Allah. Allahumma la mani'a lima a'atayt wa la mu'atiya lima mana'at and this is what we say after salah, right? It's a dua after salah taught us by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that, oh Allah, no one can prevent from us that which you decree to reach us. And no one can give us that which you decree will not reach us. This is the reality, my dear brothers and sisters. So after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam says this to Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he says to him, رُفِعَتِ الْأَقْلَامِ that the pens have been lifted and the ink has dried. Meaning the decrees have been written. Nothing is going to be changed and no one can change it. Right? So we see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaching us about tawakkul. In another narration he says, be mindful of Allah and you will find him before you. And get to know Allah in prosperity and he will know you in adversity. And know that what has passed you by was not going to come to you in the first place. If it missed you, it wasn't meant to come to you, right? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is teaching us this. That if it missed you, it wasn't meant to come to you. And that which reaches you was never meant to miss you. Allahu. How many times, brothers and sisters, do we enter into sadness and some states of depression because that deal was missed? Or that sister got married to another guy? Or that guy got married to another sister, <laughs> right? How many times do we say, subhanallah, if only, if only, if only. Subhanallah, we opened the door to shaitan. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned us against saying, Law, if only, so that we don't open the door to shaitan. Put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is from the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also, my dear brothers and sisters, that which teaches us how noble tawakkul is, is the fact that Allah in his book subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us time and time again towards tawakkul, time and time again. Allah says, وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى الْحَيِّ الَّذِي لَا يَمُوتِ Allah says, and rely upon the ever-living who does not die. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's Surah Al-Furqan, ayah number 58. And Allah says in Surah Al-Ahzab, ayah number 3, وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلًا and rely upon Allah and sufficient is Allah as a disposer of our affairs. In Surah Al-Imran, ayah number 159, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَوَكِّلِينَ And when you have finally decided, Put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Leave it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, Allah loves those who rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not those who rely on themselves and rely on their intelligence and rely on their abilities. Allah loves those who rely in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah An-Naml, ayah number 79, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّكَ عَلَى الْحَقِّ 
Allah says to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so rely upon Allah. Allah is commanding Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So imagine what the situation should be with the followers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If the one who was receiving revelation is being commanded towards relying on Allah, what should be your case and my case? Allah says, rely upon Allah. Indeed, you are upon the clear truth. Surah Ibrahim, ayah number 12. وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُتَوَكِّلُونَ And upon Allah, let those who would rely, place their reliance. In Surah At-Tawbah, ayah number 15. وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ And upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let the believers place their trust. Time and time again. You know, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us once, it was plenty. But He's telling us time and time again. You know why? Because it's important. Just like how you and I tell our children time and time again, study, did you study? Are you sure you studied, right? We'll repeat, we'll remind, we'll check, we make sure, why? It's important that they study, right? It's important. So we don't mind repeating ourselves. It's not boring to repeat yourself with something that is important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala time and time again, place your trust in Allah. Place your trust in Allah. Place your trust in Allah. It's so important, my dear brothers and sisters. And this is from the worship of the heart. I mean, how many times has Allah commanded us towards salah in the Quran? And how many times has Allah commanded us towards fasting in the Quran? But how many times has He commanded us towards tawakkul? How many times has He commanded us towards taqwa? This is worship of the heart, my dear brothers and sisters. And you know what? For those who ponder, you will come to know that you know from the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een they were those who are not known for a lot of salah and a lot of fasting and a lot of charity in fact if you look at those who came after the Sahaba we find these these narrations reach us that they used to read the whole Quran in one night they would perform Salatul Fajr what the wudu of Salatul Isha right we hear this from those after the Sahaba but how come the Sahaba were the best of all generations you know why, my dear brothers and sisters? Because the level of worship of the heart was so high that no one after them will reach that level. Subhanallah. So it's, it's the heart. Today, many people observe the salah and this is good, alhamdulillah. And they fast and this is good, alhamdulillah. But when adversity strikes, what happens to their iman? It starts to shiver. They start questioning. Ya Allah, why me? Right? Why is this happening to me? I'm making dua. Well, Allah is not answering my dua. I've been going through difficulty for so long. I don't know how long I can take this for. I'm asking Allah for help. I don't know why the help is not coming. Do we not hear this? And from people who pray a lot and fast a lot and pray the Quran a lot, mashallah. I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing this. We should be doing this. But as we do this and look after the worship of the body, we need to look after the worship of the heart. And tawakkul is from this. And thus Allah reminds us time and time again, ayah after ayah, ayah after ayah, Ayah after ayah, place your trust in Allah. Place your trust in Allah. Understand all successes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amazing, amazing, my dear brothers and sisters, right? And you know what? When we go through difficulty, trust comes in Allah. Let's be honest, when it's exam time, what happens? Where's the students here? Who's this? Anyone studying here? Put up your hand if you're studying. MashaAllah, most of the audience. What happens exam time? What happens to our dua? Firstly, we start making dua, MashaAllah, <laughs> right? Right? And then the du'as become amazingly perfect. Say, Ya Allah, you are the knower of everything, Ya Allah. You know the questions in the exam, Ya Allah. Now, I don't know the questions, but you know. This syllabus of mine is so big, Ya Allah. But you know the questions. Ya Allah, make the information I need settle in my heart as I flick through the pages of this book, Ya Allah. Right? Ya Allah, you know, the person marking my exams, he's a human being. He has a heart. And all the hearts are in your control, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, when he comes to my mistakes, blind his heart, right? Now the du'as are, subhanallah, the Allahu Akbar du'as. The tawakkul is at a high level, right? We're making du'a to Allah. We're waking up for tahajjud. We're making du'a after every salah. Ya Allah, you know, I think I made a mistake there. Ya Allah, you know, when he's giving the marks, soften his heart, make him give more. If it's 78, let him write 80, Ya Allah. You are in control of everything. Ya Allah, I place my trust in you, Ya Allah. Allahu Akbar. This is how it should be, my dear brothers and sisters, all the time. 
It should be like this all the time. Baib, let's let's move on before the time finishes. From the, uh, the, the, the evidences that teach us how noble tawakkul is, my dear brothers and sisters, is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enter 70,000 people into Jannah without any questioning and without any punishment. Did you know this? Allah will enter 70,000 people. There's a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. It's an authentic narration beyond doubt. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it's a long hadith. I'm just going to paraphrase it for you because our time is coming to an end. He tells the Sahaba that 70,000 will enter. And in another narration, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explains the qualities of the 70,000. He says that there are people who, the gist of it, there are people who place their trust in Allah in an amazing way. They don't seek ruqya from other people. Ruqya is a, is a type of Islamic healing, right? And the scholars have said, that you are allowed to have other people, you know, read the Quran on you if you have a sickness or an illness. But what's better is for you not to ask them. If they do it themselves, that's fine. But you don't ask them. You do it yourself and put your trust in Allah. Does that make sense? So from the people that will enter paradise without any questioning are those who do not seek people's assistance with ruqya. And they do not practice branding. And they do not believe in omens. Because the Quraysh used to believe in omens, right? They would walk out of the house in the morning, take a stone, throw it at a bird. If it flew right, they say, right, let's go. We can travel today. If it went left, they say, no, today's not a good day to travel. Right? They were superstitious. And today we have these signs of the zodiac, Allah al -musta'an. And many Muslims read them. And Muslims start relating to them. They go through a bad day. They say, yeah, I read this morning in the newspaper that, you know, I'm a Gemini or I'm this and I'm that. And they said, today's not going to be a good day. So it's not a good day, Allah al right? So we must seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's protection from this and seek His forgiveness if we've practiced this, my dear brothers and sisters. So those who will enter Jannah are those who place their trust in Allah in a great way. Not in the people, not in other things. They place it in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Khair, so these are some of uh, the reasons that teach us how important tawakkul is. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, tawakkul is about taking the means and placing one's trust in Allah. It's about taking the means and placing one's trust in Allah. It's not about just placing your trust in Allah and not doing anything. And it's not about taking the means and believing in the means. I think today we have two extremes. We have a group of people who believe in the means, in their education, in their intelligence, in their abilities. That's an extreme. And we have another, they believe in the medicine that they take. I have a headache. I took paracetamol. The paracetamol will make me better. They forget about Allah. And then we have another extreme. Those who say, you know what? We won't take the means. We won't take medicine. We won't go to work. You know, this pot of rice is going to cook by itself, right? This is another extreme. It doesn't work like that. You must take the means and you place your trust in Allah. Now, does taking the means mean that you have belittled placing your trust in Allah? No, my dear brothers and sisters. In fact, from the completeness of tawakkul is to take the means, study well, study hard, plan well, strategize well, go to work, look for a job, do your best, and then put your trust in Allah. Lock your house and put your trust in Allah. This is from the completeness of tawakkul. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told his companion, tie your camel and put your trust in Allah. Understand this, that you can do what you need to do, but it is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's permission that the things that you do will work or not work. You might take the means, but it might not work. Ya'qub alayhi salam, when his sons were going back to Egypt for a second time, Ya'qub feared the evil eye falling upon his sons. So he told them, when you go back to Egypt, make sure nobody sees you as a big group again. Enter Egypt through different gates. He's telling them to strategize, to take the means. But what did he say after that? But I want you to know, that I cannot assist you against the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any way. I can advise you, you can take the means, but if Allah wills, you may still be afflicted. You can lock your house, but if Allah wills, it might get broken into. May Allah protect. Does that make sense? So put your trust in Allah, but take the means. When you take medication, take it and say, Ya Allah, I ask you to make this medication a means of my cure. Put your trust in Allah. Because you could take medicine, but Allah could decree that it won't work. Does that make sense, my dear brothers and sisters? So it's very important that we make uh, this matter 
uh, extremely uh, clear. My dear brothers and sisters, just to offer some evidence to the fact that we must take the means, Allah tells us in the Quran, when He commands us to Salatul Jumu'ah, that after the Jumu'ah is finished, فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Go out in the land. وَابْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ Go and work. Go and do your job. Go and earn. Why does Allah command us to this? If tawakkul is about not taking the means, does that make sense? So if somebody tells you tomorrow that what's the evidence that I need to take the means, tell them the evidence is that Allah commands us to go and work after Salatul Jumu'ah. Why would he command us to do this? Indeed, he's the provider, right? So this is evidence, inshallah. Uh, just ending off, my dear brothers and sisters, I'll end off with um, a statement of a wise man. His name was Hatim al-Asam. Hatim al-Asam is said to be a person who lived in the third or fourth century of Islam. He was from a place known as Balkh, which was one of the major cities of Khurasan, which in today's world map, we would sort of say northern Afghanistan. Allah knows best. He was from this region. He was very wise. He had a lot of wise statements, right? And they actually call him the Luqman of our Ummah because we know Luqman was a wise man. Someone said to him, Someone said to him, how do you practice tawakkul? So he said, I practice tawakkul by knowing that my sustenance, no one can take it away from me. It's from Allah. No one can take it away from me. It's Allah's job to provide. No one can take it away from me. So I've become a very content person. So the person said to him, okay, so how do you eat? Meaning, how did you Get yourself to this level and come to this understanding that it is Allah who provides. How did you get to this level? He said from a few ayat in the Quran. From a few ayat in the Quran. He said in Surah Hud, ayah number 6, Allah says, and there's no creature on earth, but that upon Allah is its provision. And he knows its place of dwelling and place of storage. All is in a clear book. And he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Dhariyat, Ayah number 57 to 58. I do not want from them any provision. Allah is saying, I do not want from them any provision, nor do I want them to feed me. Indeed, it is Allah who is the continual provider and sustainer and the firm possessor of strength. And he says in Surah Al-A'raf, Ayah number 96, Allah says, and if only the people of the cities had believed and feared Allah, we would have opened upon them blessings from the heaven and the earth but they denied the messengers. So we seized them for what they were earning. And he says in Surah Nuh, ayah number 13, he says, Nuh said, ask forgiveness from your Lord. Indeed, Allah is the perpetual forgiver. He will send rain from the sky upon you and give you increase in your wealth and give you increase in your children and provide you with gardens and provide you with rivers. Subhanallah, what amazing advice, my dear brothers and sisters. May Allah make us from the mutawakkilun. Ameen. And may Allah forgive our past when we lacked tawakkul. Ameen. And may Allah inspire us to revise our lives and revise our association with the name of Allah known as al wakil Ameen. And may Allah make us a better people as a result of this lecture. Ameen. Last but not least, I end with an ayah in the Quran. And that ayah provokes thought. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Talaq, ayah number three, وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَالِغُ أَمْرِهِ قَدْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدْرًا And whoever relies upon Allah, then Allah is sufficient for him. Indeed, Allah will accomplish his purpose. Allah has already set for everything a decreed extent. May Allah grant us the understanding. Ameen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. I love you all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are you tired of all these annoying ads on YouTube? Are you worried that a haram video might pop up? Well, the One Islam TV app is here to solve these problems, inshallah. The One Islam TV app is 100% free of any ads and is safe to browse for your peace of mind. Watch or listen to lectures and lessons while you work, rest or drive with your device switched off. Watch videos on demand or download videos and watch offline. 
Watch hundreds of high quality produced Islamic reminders, Quran learning videos, stories of the prophets, and so much more. Two to four new videos uploaded daily, inshallah. One Islam TV is 100% run and owned by Muslims, which means a small amount you pay for your subscription is a sadaqa jariya, continuous charity for you as we use the funds raised to continue producing more beneficial videos and reminders, inshallah. The One Islam TV app is now available on Apple devices, Apple TV, Android devices, Android TV, Amazon Fire TV, and Roku so you can watch on most devices and smart TVs. Download now for a free 7-day trial. May Allah reward you for supporting our work.